Welcome back to The Bourbon Lens with your hosts, Jake and Scott. And this is the first podcast of 2024. While it will release in February, don't worry. It's the first time we've recorded. So if we sound rusty, Scott's going to make us sound good. In this week's episode, we are here to feature Filmland Spirits. If you remember back from 2022, we sat down with Troy and we talked about the the launch of the program. And now we're going to see what they're up to in the year 2024 and beyond. So sit back and buckle in and listen to our latest episode featuring Filmland Spirits. Troy Blotnick, CEO of Filmland Spirits. What is going on, man? How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you guys for having me again. Really appreciate being back. Yeah. Um, First time, long time. <laughs> Second time, long time. It, it's been an amazing year since I saw you last. Just amazing. We've had so much success and so much progress. And the momentum right now on our brand and our company is just great. Yeah. So that that's awesome. And for people who don't know, I think the first and foremost thing is we're going to give everybody just a small recap if you've not heard of a Filmland Spirit. So um, probably the one of the most produced from a branding perspective in the game, right? Uh, because of, of what your all's background is in this, this kind of B-roll, not B-roll, but like B film type movie. So explain to to people the idea behind Filmland and you know what you all are doing right now. Sure, absolutely. So myself and one of my partners, Charlie, used to be screenwriters long, 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 long time ago. And so we combined our passions for bourbon and movies together to create Filmland Spirits. And what we do is we create an original script for every one of our products. And it's one that pays homage to the B movies of the mid 20th century, robots and monsters, big over the top characters and plots. And then we create a poster for that script that becomes the label. And it's illustrated in these bright eye catching colors, very pulp art style from the mid 20th century. And then the label itself had one side of it is all about the movie. So this is a synopsis of the movie, the characters, their bios, the headshots. And then the other side is all about our award-winning liquid, who we are, what it tastes like. And then we try and slam as much transparency on there as we can. So not just where it's bottled and distilled, but the mash bill right down to the char of the barrel is right on there. Yeah. Uh, which is which is great, I think, in this day and age, because transparency is everything to the 2024 consumer, it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. And that's always when when we started, that was definitely one of our tenants is anything we you know, we are not contractually obligated to not share. We are going to share because great bourbon, I think, is made lots of different places. And we have bourbon from different places, including Kentucky, including Indiana and including other places that will be in future releases. Man, it's all about the story, too. It's like there's so much on the label. It's like just keep reading. Mm-hmm. And it just peels back the layers of what's in the bottle. Yeah. We, we've had people uh, refer to our bottle as like the adult cereal box. So, you know, when you were a kid and you sat there reading the cereal box and there was always something to keep people like, yeah, when I'm sitting there sipping, I'm just reading the bottle and I'm always finding new things. And we have all kinds of Easter eggs uh, on our labels as well. Mm. So now I need to get my, my ring decoder at the bottom of the bottle when I get done, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Send in the little stamps to the yeah, yeah, exactly. PO right. box. Yep. And uh, I get uh, the decoder ring and then you read the decoder and it's like you get let down. There, what was the movie? There was a, there was a movie with uh, the, oh, it was um, the Christmas story when uh, he like sends in and like the decoder ring is like eat your vegetables or something like that. I, I don't really care for that movie, so I don't remember what it says, but it was, it was he was so, Ralphie was so excited and it just like, so let down. Disappointment. <laughs> so if you do that, don't be a disappointment. Um, <laughs> so, so Troy, one of the, one of the cool things is, you know, in, in this day and age, um, is the ability to expand. Bourbon is definitely an exciting uh, category as well as just whiskey overall. Um, so since we caught up last, I know you all have started to march into different territories across the country. So where are you all being distributed and what's it like to go into to new territories and, and try to you know share the, the story of Filmland? So we, we launched in September of 2022. And at that time, we we're in uh, California, home of the movies in Kentucky, home of bourbon. Uh, Since then, we've expanded, let's see, in the West, we're in Nevada, Arizona, Washington, and Alaska. And then um, in the middle of the country, we're now in Kansas. 
And coming up in about a month, we will be in Colorado. And then there's a couple more markets coming in the spring as well. Um, it's It's been, I hate to just be Mr. Positive all the time, but it's been awesome. I mean, every time we go into a new market, we are so embraced. People are just like, yes, this is so different. This is so cool. This is exactly what bourbon and whiskey need. Um, Washington State, let's see, in October, I think I did a lot of launch events in Washington State, and they loved it. We had um, we had bars where they decided to last minute to do a Halloween party themed around our products, and the bartenders all dressed up as characters from our movies. <laughs> um, That's and awesome. we've done the Washington. So in Washington, I spent time in like Seattle, Tacoma, Bellevue, Redmond, that whole kind of area. And that's it's funny, people don't understand, but I feel like that's the closest community from a bourbon perspective to Kentucky that I found outside of Kentucky. Hmm. There's just a real appreciation for the liquid, a real appreciation for the process, for the craft cocktails and all of that. And just the vibe there, remind, I felt like people cared so much about it the way they do in Kentucky. So I really enjoyed opening that market. And similar kind of vibe, I, I spent a lot of time recently in Kansas City on the Kansas side opening it up. And people are are crazy for their whiskey and their bourbon there in a great way. We have there's a store um, in um, I think it's Lenexa, uh, which is near Kansas City. Um, before we were even in there, they covered their entire front of their windows with Filmland. It is an amazing display; it, like brought me to tears. It's all of our posters from our labels, giant, like as tall as me, covering the whole the whole front of their store. And then we did a, a tasting there. I'll tell you, I, I've done. Between Thanksgiving and New Year's, I think I was traveling more than I was actually home and, and did, I think, about 10 tastings in about eight cities or something like that. And each time we do it, we've been breaking records for number of bottles sold in a two-hour tasting at these locations, including in Kentucky at uh, Blind Pig in Bardstown and Justin's House of Bourbon in uh, Louisville. Oh, sweet. So, you know, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that's that's all about partnerships too, right? And um, making sure that your distributors are are positioning you right. So as a, and this is not a knock, but a small small fish in a giant pond, you know how how are you going about you know partnering with the right people and creating the right conversation to make sure that the Filmland message gets out to to your constituents? So we we've made a conscious decision to partner with. Um, I don't want to say smaller, but more regional based distributors. So we're, we're not with the, you know, quote unquote national guys at this point. So we can get, you know, a little bit more personal relationships and face to face. And um, we want distributors, we, we've been making sure that they get us, that they're excited about us, that they see how we're different and how we're unique and they get it. And then once we, you know, once we're really sure that they understand that, we will actually spend a lot of time training their salespeople. So I will fly to their general sales meetings and I will give them, you know, a 30 minute presentation on Filmland, a tasting and a training so they understand, so they can go out and represent it as close to as how I would represent it as possible. And then I will work the market as much as I can possibly be there, whether it's myself or my partner, Charlie, or my partner, Kristen, we will be there to go introduce ourselves to the accounts, you know, to the retail stores and to the buyers and the owners and give them the pitch and show it to them and have them taste it. Yeah. I mean, sweat equity, right? Like that's what you got to build and, and bourbon and whiskey is a relational thing. Um, and if you're, yeah. if you're not pounding the pavement and building relationships with people, that, that can be very difficult, you know, moving into what you, we've seen since we've talked to you last was the kind of the big, the big launch of Kentucky bourbon festival, you know, four or five months ago. So you're probably already thinking about this year's, Kentucky Bourbon Festival coming up in 2024. But what was it like to launch two new products that that extended cut uh, Rise of the Robots and um, oh, is it the the House on the End of Tomorrow? T town at the End town of Tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and I know that I enjoyed both of them. From what I remember, it was you know it's hot as always at Kentucky Bourbon Festival. So you're like, did that hit my palate? Yes, it did. I remember it being good. So that that was it. <laughs> Great. So so this was not only uh, I had never attended Kentucky Bourbon Fest, and this so my first time attending was actually as an exhibitor. Um, it was first of all, it was super fun. It created so much momentum for Filmland. I don't know how many people stopped by, but I'll tell you, we we were calculating. So kind of coincidentally, we had a meeting day about 
2024 Kentucky Bourbon Festival. I actually had two meetings about it. And we were looking at our notes from, from this past year, and we calculated we probably poured about 5,000 pours over the three and a half days or so that we were there. And Town at the End of Tomorrow got picked to be poured at the Rare Pours Bar in the VIP tent, which was amazing. Um, so we launched, we, we released the two new products. So we have, we have five products now. We have our three products we launched with originally, Moonlight Mayhem 94 Proof Bourbon, Moonlight Mayhem Extended Cut Cast Strength Bourbon, Rise of the Robots 94 Proof Bourbon, and then at the festival, we launched Rise of the Robots Extended Cut Cast Strength. So those are our four core products that are intended to always be available. But then our first limited release, Town at the End of Tomorrow, is a Kentucky straight nine-year-old bourbon. We released at the festival. We're sold out of it at this point. I know it's still on a few store shelves, and you can order some from our website. Um, we're being asked by all our distributors to make more. Um, <laughs> we didn't. We didn't intend to. So there's some conversation, maybe because we're we're our intention is to release it again when it's a little bit older. Mm. But uh, there, there's some conversation. We may do a spring release and and drip a few more bottles out there. We'll see what happens. But it was it was a great experience. We had so much positive reaction because we had a very just like our bottles, our booth was very colorful. It kind of stood out a little bit. So you're walking by and I just watch people's faces and I can see in their minds go, what the heck is that? Right. And I just run over to them and grab them and say, you got to come over, come over. And people said just such amazing reactions to the artwork and to the liquid and, and to tasting all of it. So my, the only part that wasn't great about Kentucky Bourbon Fest is we were so busy. I never really got a chance to go around and see anybody else's booths or taste anybody else's stuff. Mm. <laughs> it's a good problem to have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It is a it is a whirlwind of time and uh it is the best of times and for the for the presenters it's probably the worst of times uh because you your feet are probably sore after those 3 days. <laughs> My my feet were sore, and I realized we never ate like all day long. We just we would you know I'd have breakfast, and then the whole day would go, and we'd get back. <clears throat> excuse me, we rented an Airbnb, and so we'd go back and go. I think we need to eat because I haven't eaten in like ten hours. <laughs> so, but it was I loved I loved every minute of it. It mm. was so much fun. Lost my voice. Probably explained the brand you know thousands of times over the first few days. But you know it is it has also led to a lot of great stuff for us. We met a lot of people that is, and those people have opened up a lot of doors for us since. No, that's, that's great. So when you all think about, you know, kind of the, the next evolution, right. Of, of film land, like you all have to plan cause you, you all do a lot of work to create the B-roll movie, uh, and everything that goes into it, you know, what's it like from a lifestyle perspective from start to finish to kind of build that out for like, you know, what is the next, you know, limited time offering? So we, we have a product roadmap that goes out about five years. Mm. Uh, but like, like anything, it changes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So town at the end of tomorrow was not intended to be released. It was, um, last spring when, um, I had the story idea I've had for a while. And I always say to people, we, we have more story ideas for products than we'll ever get to do, at least in my lifetime. Um, but the story idea I've had, it was rattling around. And then for a bunch of different reasons, last spring, I just decided I want to release Town at the End of Tomorrow. And I want to release it as, a, a, as old of a product as we can, an aged product. Um, because that's the the story connects so much with a the story's about aged bourbon, essentially, uh, and so we started looking for a liquid to fit the story, and we gave ourselves a deadline because it takes us about six months to put a product together, mm -hmm. you know, just from just from the artwork and the and the production and all of that, um, and we didn't have six months to get it together. So I really pushed my team hard, and there were times they were not happy with me about it. But we gave ourselves a deadline. If we didn't find um, a liquid uh, in time, we weren't going to be able to do it. And like literally, like the day before the deadline, we found the liquid that made sense from both an age standpoint, a quality standpoint, the taste of it, as well as a, a, a budget standpoint. And then it was a whirlwind getting ready to do the festival, releasing two new products at the same time for the festival. Uh, it was it was really challenging, but I've never had so much fun as I'm having now with Filmland. So that's interesting. You say it's like six months, you know, from concept to, uh, I guess, putting it in the bottle and releasing it. But my, my question would be, 
you always hear about these TTB like label approvals Mm -hmm. and and our friend Jacob coming whiskey, he's always on top of it, but it seems like a lot of these labels, they're, they're very basic, right? (laughs) Bare Mm -hmm. minimum. You got the brand name, might have a logo on the back. You might have the stated distillation and you know, your surgeon general warning or whatever, but like your labels, like it's a movie poster, right? It, It, there's tons of details. Have you guys yeah. experienced like any difficulty with the TTB coming back and saying like you guys have too much shit on your labels or <laughs> like not not really because I'm you know I'm a I'm a nerd and so I've studied the rules long before because I you know yeah. we we invest a lot of money in the artwork and and you know we trademark everything that's on our labels that's trademarkable and so we want to make sure that it's going to pass. We've only had one thing get kicked back. And it was um, for Rise of the Robots uh, extended cut. I in in the tasting notes, I used a word to be as a metaphor, but they found it was too literal. And you can't. There's certain statements you can't make about whiskey, like it 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 can't energize you. It can't give you energy. And I think I used the word energize as like a half joke in there. And they kicked it back and said you can't say energize. So I changed uh, it. I changed the word uh, to mobilize because nah. um, in our tasting notes, we always end our tasting notes with something about the movie. Like I think in Moonlight Mayhem, it says it's a blend that will delight werewolves and humans alike. And I think on Rise of the Robots Extended Cut, I said something like it will, you know, uh, mobilize your your army of robots or something like that. So originally it said energize and they kicked that back. But, you know, the the process you know, things were slow during COVID before we were really active, but they, they've they picked it up. I mean, we get a response within a few days. Yeah. And so, and then, you know, we were able to change it, turn around. So less than a week, we our labels, but nothing else has ever been kicked back. I'm sure those examiners are probably excited to see some of your labels because they're like, this is actually interesting for once. I, I'll tell you when I can, this is like my favorite thing. So I always say that we don't take ourselves too seriously. We take our liquid really seriously, but ourselves and our labels, not so much. Um, so the inspector who kicked back that um, Rise of Robots extended cut label, he it, on the form that you get sent back, they describe what their issue is with it. And the way he described it, he said, you can't use the word energize that you've used on the right side of the label in the puffery. Meaning he was referring to our tasting notes in our language as puffery, which just cracks me up every time I think about it. It's just, it's just funny because it's like, as whiskey nerds, like this is the type of stuff we like to see on labels. Like we like to turn the turn the bottle around and figure out what the hell's in it. Like yeah. we we kind of get the benefit of seeing all the press releases with all the details, right? You know, so it's like we love that stuff. We try to convey it to you know some of our readers on Bourbon Lens and things like that, but a lot of people don't get that. It's it's, it's not on the back of the label. They don't know. Mm-hmm. So right. it's like and, these, you just turn the bottle around and you, you can read a lot into it. Right, and we put it on our website too. So if you go to the product page for each of our products, there's actually even more information. Like we don't, we don't put age statements typically, <clears throat> excuse me, on our core um, lineup. Because we say everything we always put in the bottle is going to be at least four years old. Um, but if we can on our website, we'll put the age of the of the current batch, that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I really enjoy it as as Scott said from a a nerd perspective because like one of the things we like to do is we will we'll review these products during the week of of the the podcast uh, here in a couple of weeks, and I think I've I know I've had. Rise of the Robots before, uh, but it was really nice to come back to it. And it was really cool just to flip it around. Like, I didn't have to go find a press release. I didn't have to go look online. Like, shout out Breaking Bourbon. They have everything that you ever need <laughs> for Mac bills and yada, yada. Didn't have to go look at their site and find this out. Like, I could just turn around and be like, oh, hey, it's 95.5. Like, you know how nice that is to not have to guess at what the hell the mash bill is? Like, it's amazing. Like, yeah. Um, because also, when you drink enough whiskey, and and I'll I'll speak more to the to the bourbon now. Like, okay, twenty one percent rye. Like, okay, these are the characteristics I'm kind of looking for when I see a little bit of a higher rye content than maybe most Kentucky bourbons, um, or you know, a higher malted barley content. What's that going to do? Uh, lower corn, higher corn, like all those things. Like, my mind starts to get racing on what I should expect, 
And then like if it something dings off what I think is normal, then it's like that's a tasting note, right? Like right. you know, I think so many times everyone could probably put the same 10 tasting notes for everything. But then it's like I I'm, I'm not this person, so everyone you can make fun of me. I will not give you a great metaphor or a story on how awesome it is or give you puffery. I will give you straightforward notes as will Scott cuz he's a lawyer by trade. <laughs> um <laughs> So, you know, but those people who can come up with the most immaculate story off of tasting whiskey, like, good for them. Ain't going to be us. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we, you know, we're writers, so we like to, uh, we like to um, wordsmith as much as we can and try and evoke, create, create, you know, evoke a feeling with the words as well. So that people, if people read it before they taste it, they got a sense. And I'm not, you know, when I lead tastings, most of the time it's with a lot of distributors or retailers or that kind of thing who, you know, they know how to taste. And I always say, I don't like to lead the witness. Mm. Yep. You know, I don't want to tell you what you're going to taste because you're going to taste what you're going to taste and what you had for breakfast this morning and when you brushed your teeth and all that is going to affect it. Um, so go ahead and, you know, I'd rather hear what you taste. You tell me so I can see how close it is to what I taste. Yeah. So speaking of tastings, uh, we always do like to talk a little bit about this. Scott, what's in your glass right now? I've got both, but I'm happy to start with either, really. Well, let's let's start with the lower proof, even though I'm I have in my hand currently the the bourbon. Because I, I as as I said at the at the onset when we hopped on the call, um, man, Rise of the Robots ninety four proof is crushable from a, a rye whiskey perspective. It's super easy drinking. I think the nice thing about it is it's versatile. It could be a cocktail, it could be a neat pour. It could be over a rock. Like I think it, it lends lends itself to to a lot of cool things. And so this is a, a ninety five five mash bill. Uh, I was, if you saw my eyes wondering, Troy, I was trying to figure out the price points on on everything. So what go to market? What do, what is Rise of Robot in in the marketplace? So you know we don't get to set the price the individual yeah, yeah. retail stores do, but we can suggest. You know that's what yeah. the manufacturer suggested. So fifty nine ninety nine is Rise of the Robots. Yeah. So. And in in rye whiskey, you know, you can get a lot of a lot of robust flavors at various different ages, uh, which is which is great. Uh, and so, Scott, I know rye's not your jam, but I think this one kind of may may fit your 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 taste profile a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's super like right up front, and then it kind of finishes a lot more like dark and like rich. It's it's really, I'm not saying weird, but. It, it's kind of surprising, right? Like I, everybody knows this. I don't like grassy rise. They're just, I, if I want to cut grass, I'll cut grass. But <laughs> like this one just like starts out like it's bright, fresh. Yep. And then as you kind of like let it linger, it's like darker, like cinnamon, chocolatey. Yeah. So, I mean, it starts like minty, minty and fresh. And then just kind of transitions and like lingers and, 94 proof I think I think it actually drinks a little bit warmer than that like it it feels like it has a little bit more body but it also feels like it has a little bit more like kick to mm. it too yeah no. so so the key word there minty we are big fans of minty rice I mean it's part of why we go with 955 mash bill but we when we are blending we are always aiming to make sure we got plenty of mint mm. in there because okay. it just that's we're we're a big fan of that. So I, I'm excited that you just said mint. Yeah, <laughs> right. So the, you, the way you described it is very often the way I will describe it as well. And then we have an interesting thing about this seems to be happening with both our rye and our bourbon, which is people tend to say that our cast strength they almost perceive it to be lower proof with less bite than our 94 proof, which they tend to perceive you know has a little bit of extra to it which I just think is, is, is fascinating. It just tells me the flavors that are coming through in that higher proof stuff are more powerful than the alcohol bite. Yeah. Oh. You know, for me, I don't know what it is, but you, you know, you talked about what did you do today? I was like, well, I cleaned a lot of baby bottles and we have a new like Dawn power wash is the, is the, the stuff I'm not sponsored by Dawn, but I should be, I go through a lot of Dawn power wash and, uh, it cleans baby ducks. So if it's good enough for baby ducks, it's good for my enough for my, my baby's bottles. Uh, but we got this fresh pear scent that, so I, I'm smelling pear all the time at my house. And one of the things that was really interesting, it was like, it was orchard fruit, pear, 
um, citrus, butterscotch, vanilla, like all in the nose, really sweet, rich flavors. And then like it became almost like a, instead of baked apple pie, like a baked pear pie, like the cinnamon, the nutmeg pear started to show up like, like mushy pear. And I was like, huh? Like, I don't know if that was just what I had, but I, I really liked how it was really fragrant. It reminded me of an orchard and instead of picking apples, I was picking pears. Uh, in this example here. And, and it also had like a, some nuttiness to it, like some, some pine, some wood, some walnut. Like I, I liked that part of the element that I don't always get in rye is some nuttiness. And I did like that, how it showed up in, in the whiskey overall. And I, I, what I would say is the end reminded me a lot of like an Alamode, pick whatever Alamode you want. Uh, but with some cinnamon, some nutmeg, some vanilla, and it was just it just rounded out really nice on the on the back with um, all those flavors that uh, are making me salivate right now. <laughs> it's so funny that you just said pear. If uh, my partner Charlie was here, he'd be cracking up with <laughs> us because we just did a, a blending session. We did our first one in California where Charlie flew out here, and then our other partner Steve, who does the blending with us, uh, he came over and we just spent three or four days together. And on the first day of blending, when we were tasting all of our samples, Charlie like repeatedly kept putting down a tasting note of pear, <laughs> which none of us had put down ever before in one of our blending sessions. So we're tasting. He's like, I got pear again. I got pear. And finally, I just turned to him and I go, what shampoo did you use this morning? Yeah. Like, did it have like a pear scent to it? Because I think you're being affected by that in some way. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like it, it, it's wild. And, and maybe I'm getting a little more sweetness because I had like a bite of like cream cheese frosting but mm -hmm. i think cream cheese frosting is like the best accent to whiskey that anyone could possibly have and uh, mm -hmm. if if you don't know anything about nothing but cakes should be sponsored by them too they're amazing if they sponsor us we're gonna be 500 pounds a piece <laughs> hey then i'll be on tlc i'll be making all types of money all good look i know i know how to parlay uh one one sponsorship into a an, into a reality tv show oh man B bunts and bourbon shit i just i just oh so i i have a hard transition here um i have a a question for you so we talked about the rye first but what was your first love was it rye whiskey was it bourbon was it scotch like what was your first you know whiskey love um it was a bourbon bourbon so i probably had you know, I probably had Jack Daniels as a, let's say, a 21 year old. <laughs> um, but uh, 21 no, in quotations, in college right? with, with a bottle of Jack Daniels. But I think I was pretending to drink for drink it for the picture. Um, but I just, you know, when I started falling in love w with whiskey, it was bourbon. Mm. And then, you know, at like a lot of bourbon drinkers, you get so into it, and you're like, well what is this rye stuff? And so then I started drinking rye and I really love rye. I mean, I love them both, but you know, uh, and I have different, different occasions and different moods that I prefer one over the other, but, um, but it started with bourbon and led to rye. I'm not really a scotch guy. Mm. Um, there are some scotches that I do like. Um, I, I tend to not drink peated scotch cause that's the last thing you can drink at the night. You know, it's like, that's it. Once you've had that, you're done. Um, but there are a few, you know, a, a few scotches that I, I, I apparently have very expensive taste in scotch because <laughs> so, the As ones I should. like are all very expensive. So just stay away. Just yeah. stay away. Right. Well, I do like Irish whiskey though. Okay. So I, I've definitely developed a taste for Irish whiskey. So now this begs the question, Irish whiskey is like TTB's nightmare. So I'm glad we can't make it in America. Uh, because they have like seven different types, <laughs> types of it. So they have single malt, single grain, single, just single, single still, um, pot still. What type of Irish whiskey do you like? That is, that is the more relevant question. Right. You know, you know, I don't tend to pay attention to my Irish whiskey the way I do bourbon and rye. Mm. So I don't, I don't pay attention to, you know, what it's made from, or I just, there are certain brands. Ah that I like. I mean, I, I have no problem. Sam, I'm, I'm a huge fan of red breast. I yeah. love almost everything that they do. Mm. They have this, uh, Lestau finish one. It's in that orange box where I was just sharing that with, uh, with Charlie and Steve the other night. It, I love that stuff. So I tend to not pay attention. Like I said, to 
how it's made or what it's made from the way I do with bourbon or rye. Yeah. I always get like uh shortbread cookies from like Irish whiskeys, like vanilla cookie. Like, and that's what I like. Sometimes I'll find it in bourbon with a little bit more punch, a little bit more oak punch. But like when you find like that sweet cookie, like almost find um, back in the day when you could go to McDonald's and get those McDonald cookies. That's what I always get for Irish whiskey. So I think like when I find a really good Irish whiskey, that's that's what triggers a memory. I will say a lot of things about Irish whiskey. Unless it was finished single grain whiskey. Uh, mm. uh, but I do love Irish single malts. Irish single malts will rival a really good single malt scotch. And the scotch people are probably like loading up their muskets to shoot me right now. But uh, Loading their muskets. <laughs> <laughs> hey, England didn't give them the good stuff We're going yet. Way back, yeah. Um, <laughs> but but speaking of of bourbons and and unique flavors, like Scott's uh, throwback to like the 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 Hamburglar uh, at right. McDonald's, um, Grimace, Grimace. Hey, it, it was just his like thirtieth hey, birthday. What's new is old again. Or what's old is new again. Hey, if, if they can celebrate Grimace's birthday, I need a Hamburglar birthday coming up. Um, but Moonlight Mayhem, and I, I do love this tagline, a saga of werewolves and bourbon, and then this is the full moonproof. I think that's hilarious. 114 proof, cast strength bourbon whiskey, uh, 7521 f- four. Um, this is MGP mash bill. What I found very interesting about this whiskey was like how I felt like if I was at a campfire drinking hot chocolate, like I get milk, chocolate, and cherries start to finish. And it's almost Mexican hot chocolate on the nose. So a little bit of cinnamon, a little bit more nutmeg. And like, this is my bourbon. Like I could drink and drink and drink this. And 114 proof, I didn't think it was hot. I thought it was just kind of like mellow, super, super nice. Um, if you like sweet bourbons, like like sweeter profiles, I think this kind of kind of meets you there. It's not dry. It's not. But that milk chocolate note, start to finish so good yeah that that's i mean i you probably didn't read the tasting notes on the bottle but it says the first thing it says is cherries and chocolate because that's i always taste chocolate covered cherries mm. i'm like that that that's what i get from it um so that's a big reason why that tasting note is on there but yep that's exactly uh especially especially on the nose and on the tongue the the finish one of the things we love about this is it's got a really long finish and it kind of goes on and on if you sit and wait it does evolve and you start to get some of those more like leather and oak and wood kind of notes in there um, as it evolves. Yeah, I kind of get, I kind of get like a lingering spice at the end. Um, but I'm thinking like, like Rolo candies, chocolate caramel candy. It's, it's sweet without being overly sweet. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. Like sometimes you taste a, a bourbon and you're just like, oh, this is like sugar. But this one's just like, it just kind of like rides a wave. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like super traditional, like bourbon to me. Like it's what bourbon should taste like. I mean, I would guess that this is probably like six years old, five, six years old, but it's like, it's just finds like a sweet spot. Yeah, that's about it's uh it's just under six years old that batch that you're you're drinking. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a good one. Um for sure. And, and I I think this one's a, a little bit more pricey if I'm looking here online, somewhere probably between seventy five and ninety dollars is what it looks like. I like it different places online. Yeah, uh seventy nine ninety nine is our SRP on it, and I've seen it in the range you just said, I've seen it for 75 and I've seen people in California here selling it for 90, but 79, 99. And you got to pay your gallon taxes milk in California is eight bucks, isn't it? <laughs> a gallon of gas in te- and, and out there is like $12. So well, they don't even sell gas in California, right? It's just pure electric, right? <laughs> no, you can't use you, No, mm-mm, we're going to, I'm going to make a knock on, on, <laughs> on California here. you, you only have certain times a day you can charge your Tesla out there. Uh, Just plug into the nuclear power plant. What are we waiting on? Guys, I am not going to defend California. Whether you're getting any of this factually <laughs> right or not, it doesn't matter to me because I am not going to defend. It is indefensible. <laughs> hey, 
Sign me up for nuclear We're just power. Poking. We're just poking the bear. I know. Even yeah. though I've lived here for 32 years. Yeah. Well, you know. And, and, I, and I drive an electric car. So our, our podcast today that released today was with uh, Beverly Spirits. He's based in L.A., Beverly Hills. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we like to poke the bear. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'll take the fact that gas is under $3 a gallon in Kentucky all day, every day, and twice on Sunday. Like, yeah. Uh, uh, Ch- my partner, Charlie, who I mentioned, is from Atlanta, and we were driving the other day, and he looked at the – he saw the gas price. He's like, that's double what it is in Atlanta. Whew. Yikes. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's that's tough. Life's, life's tough. Um, but you get better weather than most places, so – you know, trade offs, trade offs, trade offs, yeah. and, and you get to watch football at 10 a.m. on a Sunday. <laughs> there you go. Yep. And and the Super Bowl doesn't like drag you down on a Monday. You know, right, exactly. all of us are tired at 10:30. We've drank our six Miller lights or Bud lights or whatever the hell gets you going, and uh, or Filmland spirits. And uh, there you go. You know, you you didn't you didn't have to do what we did. You know, you don't have to wake up the next morning feeling like shit. <laughs> <laughs> National holiday. Just right. It should be. It should be. Yeah. It should be. Just cancel President's Day and just give me the Monday after Super Bowl. <laughs> the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, there's enough presidents. We don't need to celebrate them all. No. Where, what? <laughs> if, if if there's a new one elected, we'll be on what 48. I think. Uh, I'll have to ask my eight year old. Yeah, I think. I think. I think Biden was 47. Ooh. Don't know. Don't care. Pray for those people. They're they're they they got a hard job, uh, and I don't want it. Okay, so we asked you all the tough, hard-hitting questions. We asked you, you know, we, we shared some thoughts about the whiskey. But the most important question is, what is next? Well, um, we've got, starting in 2025, we'll, we'll be releasing two new things a year, limited releases or special releases. Uh, we'll have both a spring and a fall release. This year, we are not necessarily doing a spring release, but we will have a, something that we introduce that's new at the Kentucky Bourbon Festival again in September. Um, and... Um, don't know exactly what it'll be. We have a couple of choices, so I'm not saying yet what it is. Could be another very aged product, uh, or could be a finished product. We're still deciding. Mm. Could be a 10 year old product. Hmm. <laughs> could, could be just doing some math here. Could, <laughs> exactly. Could be a bourbon. Could be a rye. Could be a lot of things. So, so you said something about finished. And so I, I liked finished whiskey. I think it's, it's super unique. When you think about finishes, what what gets you excited about finished? Is it is it the wine barrels? Is it the exotic cask like rum or tequila or Armagnac or Vino de Naranja? Like when you think about finishes, like what kind of gets your your mind racing in in that general direction? Um, I I do like a lot of wine finishes. I think like the unique kind of out there finishes are cool if they don't go too extreme like i've tasted stuff that i'm like well i don't just you know i don't want to drink this it was interesting to sip it once but that's so bizarre i don't want it to be bizarre i want it to make the bourbon special in a unique way or the rye special in a unique way that makes you want to drink it maybe it's not what you drink every day or all the time and i don't like finishes that make the bourbon like overly overly sweet yeah. right I don't, I don't want it to taste like a um you know, like a, a product that's had something added to it, like sweetener or cinnamon or something like that. I want it to still retain the, you know, it's, it's inherent bourbonness, Right. Um, but so I tend to like wine finishes. I do like port finishes as long as, as long as they don't make it too sweet, but we are experimenting with some unique stuff and making sure that it isn't too, you know, too far uh, away from bourbon when, when it's finished. I'm, I guess I'm just thinking out loud here, but what I like about finished whiskey is like the experimentation of like playing around with different finishes. But I feel like people commit so hard to this is a finished whiskey. So it's like everything is finished, mm-hmm. right? So it's 100% finished in port, port cask or 100% finished in maple or honey or whatever. So it's like just overwhelming, but like, I think we need to take a step back and think about like the blending aspect of it and saying, I think it's a lot like what the Japanese do. They, they say, okay, we'll take a cast that has sherry and we'll take a cast that is bourbon and we'll take a cast that is, you know, 
scotch, vanilla, you know, whatever. And we're going to blend those and marry those back. I think maybe this, this is not specific to film and just in general, it's just talking about whiskey in general. But I think with finished whiskeys, in order for people not to get burnt out on it, they're going to have to start innovating with, this is a blend of finishes, or this mm-hmm. is a blend that incorporates a finished, a partially finished whiskey. But like to do a hundred percent, like sherry bomb, boom, this is right. what you're going to get, hundred percent whatever. So I think that's why like cigar blends are kind of fun because it's like mm-hmm. plays around with those like, different casks, like port, right. um, cognac, things like that. But. I'm just speaking out loud. This right. has nothing to do with film land spirits. No, no, no. I, I, all, I, 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 but, I, I hear you. But I you agree gotta, with what you were saying. You're saying like people go so heavy handed with some of these finishes. And I think that's why it turns a lot of traditional bourbon drinkers like myself right. away from finished whiskey. Right. I think I, I like what you're saying. I think you've got to be, you got to have deep pockets and you got to be really good at what you do because you're taking, you know, if you start mixing things together that you don't know exactly what it's going to end up producing you are taking a chance, you know, you could ruin some whiskey. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And on the other hand is you could produce a big batch of port finished bourbon that is not going to be for everybody. And then right. you got a big batch of port finished <laughs> bourbon. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just an interesting thing. Like, I think it's fun that people are experimenting with finishes. And yeah. You got to do something because right. people get bored. Right. That's that's the world we live in. People live on TikTok and they s- switch videos every 15 seconds. Like people get bored with the same things. I know I don't get bored with information. Like mm-hmm. I get bored with seeing a bottle on a shelf and not knowing what it is. And I turn it around. And I can't figure out what the hell it is. And I can't figure out who made it. Can't figure out who did anything with it, where it's from. Nothing. Other than the price, I'll just put it back. So, I don't know. Maybe that's just whiskey commentary in general. But Jake and I don't, we haven't recorded in like two months. So maybe that was just itching <laughs> to get them out. Yeah. Scott, Scott was like, do something different. Uh, that's all, that's all he was getting at. Um, but yeah, man, it, it's been great to catch up. And I, I'm excited about your all's future. I'm excited to watch more trailers and, and, uh, you know, see what happens with, with your all's creative minds, because it, it's been really cool. And I think it's super unique, uh, to be able to, to just look at this stuff and go to your website and check that out, I think is really, really damn cool. And I think it's, it's something that bourbon doesn't necessarily always have and they all are providing, which is, which is pretty unique. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, um, you guys, uh, recently, uh, joined our affiliate program. We did. We are a part of that. And, uh, it's been, it's been cool. You know, we, we feature it every week in our weekly pour, which is our weekly newsletter. So we we're, we're always repping Filmland spirits in, in the newsletter. <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, and we'll make sure that, uh, those folks who get a chance to, to, to look at this podcast on, on our website, uh, we'll, we'll see it front and center. That's for sure. Scott, that's for you. Take notes. Show notes. Yeah. Show notes. <laughs> Check the show notes. Check the show notes. Check it. Yeah. And, and, you know, we love being able to help in any way we possibly can. Right. I think that's the most important thing is, is being able to help, uh, where we can to, uh, really drive engagement into brands that we, we care about. I, well, we appreciate it. We appreciate, uh, being able to come on and all the support that you guys have, uh, have given to us. It's been great. So last but not least, we always have to ask, where can people find out more about Filmland Spirits other than our, you know, our, our awesome affiliate link? Uh, well, there is, uh, we're on Instagram and Facebook at Filmland Spirits. And then, of course, our website, filmlandspirits.com, has tons and tons of information and some, a lot of fun stuff as well. That's awesome. Well, Troy, we, we truly appreciate you hopping on and, and, and hanging out with Scott and I for a little bit. Uh, and talking, talking shop and talking whiskey. And we look forward to, to seeing what's next. And now you have our minds running on what we get to try at Kentucky Bourbon Festival 2024. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you guys again soon. Appreciate look it. Forward to it. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bourbon Lens. Make sure you're connected to us via social media, Instagram, X, and Facebook. 
And if you are on the professional type, follow us on LinkedIn. Growing community there. If you want to know more about Bourbon Lens, make sure you're subscribed to The Weekly Pour, our weekly newsletter featuring our podcast, news, and reviews. For exclusive content and more, check out patreon.com backslash bourbon lens, and you get to hang out with Scott and I and get to try awesome whiskeys. And last but not least, make sure you are subscribed to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. They're on every platform. Scott does a great job. And until next time, cheers. Cheers. Cheers.